Hello and welcome back to coverage here at Grand Prix Montreal. Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Jacob Van Lunen. And we've got round number four lined up, which means Seth Manfield fresh out the gates here with his sealed deck. Blue, black, red is what he's got lined up. And then Demir with red on the other side. The difference being that three. Seth's deck is not necessarily committed to Demir. Right. It can be more, also is it. more spread out, right? Mm -hmm. Where... Matt Stein's probably just splashing for a few red cards. We'll get the deck list in just a moment. In the meantime, let's take a look at what Seth Manfield's working with. A lot of information for us. Thank you, Matthew Stein. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see what we've got. Well, he's going to write everything down. That's always a good plan, especially at a more competitive it event. It does look like he went, uh, Seth went pretty deep here. Yeah, some interesting cards here. Yeah, I see a Lotleth Giant there, the big seven drop in the middle. And then he's got, looks like a decent amount of incidental damage sources here as well. There's a Lava Coil and a Dead Weight to kill any er early creatures. And then he's got that, <coughs> that field there in the middle. Yeah, and that card does quite a bit of incidental damage when uh, you're in Is It Strategy. Uh, a lot of the time when you end up with that deck, you have a lot of creatures that fly or, you know, are evasive in some way or another. And just gumming up the ground with things like this 0-4 wall that just pings your opponent every time you cast the spell uh, can be a reasonable game plan. Uh, despite Seth Manfield having access to no blue mana here, uh, Matthew Stein decides to take the devious cover-up out of Seth's hand. So uh, perhaps understanding that uh, you know in the latest stages of the game that's where the plays that matter most are going to be happening uh, Matthew just wants to make sure that when he gets up to the amount of mana he needs to start casting his most powerful cards that Seth does not have a clean answer like cover up Demir Informant now for Matthew Stein really good card uh, it's, it's been a really good blocker. Of course, you get the trigger from the surveil for all of your different surveil shenanigans. But here, it's just okay, right? It's going to set up his next two draw steps, which he puts both back on top. But the electrostatic field is going to keep that thing at bay. Oh, wow. And uh, Matthew, using Lava Coil here on the field, uh, that is an aggressive use of the Lava Coil. But, you know, it's important to note that uh, he could find a situation wherein, you know, it, he's just getting pinged away to death and he's not applying any pressure on Seth. Gosh, that's, boy, that's a lot of respect for that electrostatic field. That, that card... You know, it reminded a lot of people of a few types of cards we've had in past sets where, you know, you get multiple activations by casting spells. But this one only triggers when you cast a spell. You don't get that free one for, you know, the first free activation like we've had in, in previous iterations of similar cards. Like that one right there, Thermo Alchemist. Thank you, Reed. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, it's also, it's not quite gutter snipe. You know, you're not getting right, that much damage, damage out of it. Yeah, It's really aggressive to use a Lava Coil on it. He must feel like this is going to be a very long game. And, you know, we'll also remember we got a chance to look at Seth's hand. The only spell he had that actually triggered it was his Lava Coil of his own. So I'm curious to see how this actually ends up going for Matthew Stein, being so aggressive where his deck looks to be more controlling overall. We're going to see Devious cover-up now for Matthew. And that is actually shuffling uh, another copy of Devious cover-up back into Matthew's library. So Matthew uh, hoping to find himself in a situation where he is... Uh, you know, always having access to hard counter magic to deal with Seth's most powerful spells. Yeah, there's three counter spells that you can play. There's actually four if you go into the rare category, but there's three that you'll play in decks like the one that Matthew has. And, you know, in my experience in Sealed, you'll see all three of them see play. Sinister Sabotage is the, the one that will remind you most of, of Cancel or, or Disallow. And, and that's a really nice card. Right. Uh, you know, having the option to... Uh, you know, look at the top of your deck, perhaps put a jumpstart card in your graveyard, perhaps just mill land when mm -hmm. you're at the middle of the late stage of the game. Uh, sometimes it, it, feels, it feels like you're doing a lot more than just countering a spell. That's right. And then 
By the way, here's Deadly Visit to kill the Demir Informant. That is some respect right there from Seth Vanfield, perhaps uh, valuing the Surveil too very highly at this point in the game as well. Um, and then, of course, Disdainful Stroke is the other card that's in this set. And, boy, I, having played it, I really liked it. I thought, yeah, this one copy did some work for me really good. I had a chance to play two copies, and I thought, okay, well, let's try that. I liked the second copy. Like, in Sealed, the card kind of just does work, and I'm really happy to have even multiple copies, which in previous sets that it had Disdainful Stroke in it, that wasn't the case. I, I was actually, um, I, in fact, I, I almost never even main decked one. Now I'm, like, kind of happy with two. It's a big difference. Yeah, I think this Sealed environment is a, a world where a card like Disdainful Stroke is, is quite strong. Uh, the fact that it allows you to... Uh, you know, play less expensive proactive spells and leave open just two mana to deal with virtually any haymaker type of thing your opponent could, uh, you know, use against you. By the way, I see the big boy in hand here for Matthew Stein. Doom Whisperer <laughs> right there for him. He's just going to windmill it. And this is where things get interesting. All right, it, there almost had to be another deadly visit, right? Like, Mm -hmm. If I'm looking at the, my board and I've got a one-fourth, my opponent at 17, and my opponent is Seth Manfield, and he goes, I'm going to go ahead and use Deadly Visit on that one four. I'm thinking, you have to have some other answer, you know, besides that Lava Coil. And, and he does, in fact, have it here to take down the Doom Whisperer. There's just no way that Seth uses a premium removal spell on a one four, right, without having some backup plan for it. I don't think so. I, I think that there there are very few situations in which he does that. Yeah. Uh, you know, perhaps the rest of his hand is cards that have two blue mana and their casting cost, something like that. He just needs to make sure that he's going to have the ability to play his cards. But two things about Doom Whisper come to mind when I see it. The first one is actually uh, one of our co-commentators this weekend, Reed Duke. You know, I had a chance to shadow the Ultimate Guard Pro Team in their prep for the Team Series Finals a couple of weeks ago. And I was just basically sitting there watching them build their decks, play out their stuff over and over again. And I got a chance to see Reed play against Doom Whisperer the first time that we had seen it, like, in play. And, you know, everybody kept picking it up like, what? <laughs> like, where's the, <laughs> like, where's the drawback? Like, how does this even work? And I remember his opponent actually had Whispering Snitch with it as well, which means it's just one life and they lose a life <laughs> per, per <laughs> activation. And it's just absolutely tearing through his library. Yeah. As, as if that card wasn't just sweet <laughs> enough as 6-6 six, six Flying Trample for, for 5. The other thing that comes to mind is our other co-commentator, Maria, is horrified by this card. She doesn't like arms? She says, it's made of arms. <laughs> like, that's, and she just keeps saying that over and over again. So. A dowser of Lights. Yep. Dowser of Lights. A lot of flavor text on that one. It's just a 4-5 for five, 5. But looks fine here. No board can start clocking Seth Manfield if he doesn't come up with an answer, and it dodges the lava coil that we saw in his hand as well. Yeah, Dowser has, uh, you know, as filler, as, you know, bottom of the barrel kind of filler, has uh, overperformed for me. I, I like five toughness. I agree. I as your five toughness is quite good in this format. As your 23rd card, you could do worse. Mm -hmm. All of that said, it's pretty bad. Yeah, I, I don't love it, yeah. but <laughs> I'm just saying, when I've played it with no, it, I've it's been true. like, huh. Me too. Same. And Seth Manfield is going to use Deadweight's sort of hidden mode. You can play it on creatures that have more than two toughness to reduce either the amount of damage that you take each turn if it's like evasive. But in this case, in combination with the Demir Informant, it just neutralizes the Dowser of Lights. Boy, Matthew Stein went deep. I'm loving this. He's got Expansion Explosion in his hand now. Yeah, his hand is stacked here. I think Hypothesis I see. is what we're going to see now. We should probably mention this... Uh, I, I did. Man I went through this at the uh, Team Series uh, finals as well. But Hypothesis is a little bit weird in it's the way that it actually. Trigger. It's actually called a reflexive trigger. Oh, okay. Did you know that? I, I, yeah. I didn't. But I, Jared I know Silva that, explained uh, this to me. Yeah, on Magic Online, you you can respond like kind of in the middle of the spell. That's like that's a good way yeah. to say it. Yeah. Traditionally, spells that remind you of, of this one will be a targeted effect that you mm -hmm. must respond to before you actually know how much damage. You know, cards like Prophetic Bolt in the past have been like, all right, I don't know how much this thing's going to do, but it, it could be any amount, mm -hmm. zero or higher. This one, though, isn't. And 
this it was something that we all had to learn at the beginning because it would be really tempting to say hypothesis of targeting your Demir informant here, right? That, that just sort of rolls off the tongue and it's kind of how you think of cards like this. But that is actually not how it works. You target it, you draw the two cards, and then if you decide to discard the card, a trigger goes on the stack and you choose the target at that time. So. Yeah, and I mean, that actually makes it quite a bit better too because you get to draw those two cards and see how your answers, how your bodies line up against your opponent's board before you have to pick a target. Mm. And sometimes what you want to be targeting changes based on those things. Also, the name is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> it's I love it. It, it <laughs> sounds like a fake name. It does. Right? It just sounds like you're, you came up with some clever nickname for the card, but it's just exactly that name. By the way, Lotleth uh, Giant hits the battlefield here for Seth Manfield. I kind of like that card. I saw it at first. I thought too clunky, too slow. I'm not really stoked on undergrowth. But it's big. It's got the five toughness that you love. And, uh, and it does usually end up getting them for some amount of damage if the game goes long. And I don't know. That, that's kind of a package I can get behind in a control deck. Yeah, I've, I've definitely lost out of nowhere to that card already. Uh, doesn't seem like Seth's deck is the most well suited to be using it. He may have also just drawn kind of the spell half of his deck, too. Uh, his deck does go long enough that this is... Uh, you know, a finisher if he was looking for a card that ends the game eventually. There's a beacon bolt in hand for Matthew Stein as well, though it doesn't look like it's quite charged up enough to kill the Lotleth Giant. I'm assuming he would have fired it off otherwise. He's going to go for a chump block here. Perhaps he's got a, a little more burn to add to the mix. Perhaps uh, the two power plus the beacon bolt is enough to finish well, off the it's giant. A sorcery, though. Oh, it is. You're right. So, not sure if he's going to be able to make that work. There's burglar rats. He could just be trying to save up enough mana. One, two, three, four. Yeah, it, with one more land. In fact, with that swamp that he discarded, he could use explosion to kill it. Oh, so he could finish it off with explosion now, even. Well, not now. He drew his card for the turn, right? Oh, he already drew his card for the yeah, turn? Yeah, he okay. could have. He could have done it. and Yeah, that would have been pretty good. I'm a little surprised he didn't, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, kill your 6-5, draw four cards. Yeah, now, it actually ended up working okay. He right. drew City Watch Sphinx, which, while slightly risky, isn't the worst-case scenario there. Oh, wow. There's a Poisoner, too, and that looks really good. Yeah, it matches up really nicely against the 6-5 body. A readable version of Expanse Explosion. <laughs> this card has uh, been very good for me. I've had it in Sealed twice now that I've played it. It's funny, the... Uh, you know, the fork effects, something like expansion, they're, they're things that don't come up that often. You know, it's not really worth playing cards like that, especially in a limited format. Uh, but when you have those as, you know, in addition to a side like explosion, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly you start using them a lot more often. Well, uh, yeah, also expansion can copy your opponent's spells, which makes mm -hmm. it so much more flexible. Because a lot of times the hard part with fork is it, you know, you need to have two mana in addition to the cost of the spell that you're trying to cast yourself, and that can make it cost prohibitive. But here, that's not actually the case. Yeah, expansion hitting something like a, a Price of Fame is very good. Here's a Midnight Reaper now for Matthew Stein. So this is starting to look pretty good for him. Though he does seem to be really just holding on. He, d he doesn't want to cast the Sphinx. He doesn't want to cast the, uh, the Explosion. He's playing the, the long game very much here. Yeah, he's playing very, very conservatively. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been uh, seems ahead fine. for quite some time. Yeah, it seems yeah. fine. I, I wouldn't hate seeing that Sphinx get out there. but Oh, boom! Here's the big kid now for Ooh. Seth Manfield. <laughs> Niv Mizzet Perun. This has uh, some people's vote for best card in the set. It's very hard to cast, but uh, when you do cast it, it feels very good. It's 
uncounterable. So any, any plans that Matthew Stein had as far as counter it goes means nope. And, uh, you know, if your opponent even has a card that's capable of killing it, remember this thing has five toughness, then you're going to get to draw a card and ping something. In this case, you're going to get to take out that Hired Poisoner, which is a very relevant death-touching body in this situation. So kind of interesting here, Jake. So uh, we were saying, wouldn't hate to see the Sphinx get ran out, right? Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> is sitting in his hand. Now, he knows that his opponent has the Lava Coil that he saw way back on turn two. So he just doesn't mm -hmm. want to run it into that. So fair enough, that makes sense. But then we were kind of going, well, don't you want to use Explosion? Chat points out, he only has one red mana. Oh. He just can't cast it right now. And that I just, makes a lot of I sense. I just missed that. Yeah, he's actually on yeah. a red splash for four cards total, but one of them has the potential to be double red, and that's this one, mm -hmm. and he can't cast it. Now, he could find an opportunity to cast Expansion because he can use blue mana for that. So, you know, if something... Uh, gets cast there, then fair enough. But he is not being patient. He just can't cast it. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Beacon Bolt. And he's... I think he might copy it. He could, he could either... Let's see what he does. Target that. And then Seth's probably going to say, well, that's not enough. But there is triggers that go on the stack because Niv-Miz, it triggers off of your instants and sorceries or theirs. And boy, if this doesn't show why Niv-Miz is such a great card, Matthew's probably going to be able to get rid of it using this sequence here. But Seth is just going to draw multiple cards and, take, and get to throw around damage too, kill the Poisoner. Or kill that. Yeah, so Matthew planning to... Uh Copy with expansion here. I think we're trying to figure out the timing of when all this happens. Seth already drew his card, so he already has a, a niv visit trigger of damage to put on the stack. It's deciding where to put that. Copy it. Dill. Feels bad, man. I mean, this is just a beating here. Especially when you consider that at the end of this, he actually is going to be able to get rid of Niv <laughs> Mizzet, and that's supposed to make you happy. Matthew will get to draw a card. Wow, that is a big the elephant. The Reaper dying. That is a really big elephant. Yeah, we have a very large. Is that a venerated Loxodon? It's my friend, <laughs> venerated Loxodon. So if you don't know what we're talking about, there's a cosplayer in the room. We'll, we'll try to get get you that in a little bit but huge oh no the elephant took his head off this isn't good all right let's <laughs> all right Rashad said he's got a, a photo of it that he'll show during sideboarding there's part of a venerated loxodon <laughs> 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 but the real deal's in the house okay so let's let the dust settle on this beacon bolt expansion nightmare maybe the last one's going to target the lotlith giant and actually have enough stuff in the yard to kill it i think they're trying to figure out when each thing goes to the yard <laughs> yeah oh so this is a really really cool play for matthew stein so what matthew stein did was he cast the beacon bolt targeting the niv mizzet then he used uh the expansion and he copied the beacon bolt and then the expansion went to the graveyard. So when the first beacon bolt resolved, it counted the expansion in the graveyard so that it would have enough instant sorceries to kill the niv mizzet The problem is here is that the, the first, the copy to resolve, may not have enough. Apparently it did. It got the job done. Yeah, so yeah, the, because he used that fork spell, when the beacon bolt resolved, it had enough. Yes. It, it, it ended up being five, which is cool, except for that Niv Mizzet drew two cards and killed the Reaper. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that. <laughs> you uh, know, it's yeah. like kind of a brutal <laughs> card, it turns out, that when you find a really neat way to kill it, it doesn't matter anyway. In fact, the, the neater the way you kill it, the more it punishes you for having done so. Indeed. And 
perhaps getting down to the wire here for Seth Manfield. He uses Demir Lockett to draw two cards. He's got a grip full of cards. He should have a lot of action. But he is a little behind on board. And we're finally going to see that lava coil, which means Matthew Stein, his patience is going to be rewarded, and he's going to be able to run out City Watch Sphinx. Now, look, if somebody kills your City Watch Sphinx normally, it's like, okay, fine, I get my, my surveil trigger, it's fine. But, but lava coil exiles, and that means that you wouldn't get it. So this patience is really going to be rewarded here for Matthew, uh, having waited all of those turns and using that information that he got from Thought Erasure way back on turn two. Very good stuff from Matthew. I like that patience a lot. I thought that was really smart of him to wait. I didn't understand why he was waiting on the explosion, but uh, yeah, turns out he wasn't waiting. <laughs> yeah. He just didn't have the mana to cast. That's it. right. He did get to leverage that card, though, by playing expansion on that last turn and killing a seven drop and a six drop, you know, again, at a severe cost, but still got the job done. Yeah, this also gives uh, Seth a little bit of a window now. Seth has uh, Matthew down to just two untapped lands, so... No devious cover-up happening at the moment. That's right, and in fact, he's, he could lose it here to Thought Erasure. Looks like there's... He's considering if he wants to play... Is it an unexplained disappearance behind the Thought Erasure? Now he's going to let him have the choice either way. Yeah, you don't necessarily want to be bouncing any rats. <laughs> yeah, he just didn't have a good target for the unexplained disappearance. He might have been thinking, well, I'm just going to get my value, but, you know... This uh, does make more sense. Sure, Seth gets to pick one of these cards, but uh, it means that Matthew gets to keep the other, so it's fine. Looks like Seth's first inclination is to take away devious cover-up. Boy, this has been quite a game, Jake. This has been a very interesting game. Yeah, long-term planning. Interestingly, mana issues, even though Matthew has 100, car 100 lands on the battlefield. Seth had some weird mana issues also where he was stuck on five lands. And <laughs> that really uh, mm -hmm. hindered his long-term game plans for a while. Leapfrog, the big finish here for Seth Manfield. Could get the job done. Assuming that he finds a way to deal with this City Watch Sphinx. If he does not, he could be in trouble. Stein's going to go into the tank here. The obvious attack is with the City Watch Sphinx. Looks like he's bought, a, he's drawn a capture sphere for the turn to go with unexplained disappearance as well. Doesn't seem to be any great reason to do Capture Sphere first, though. I suppose just to make sure that it's resolving. He, d he wouldn't want to see something like a Sure Strike or something like that that could eat the Sphinx. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I'd like to see a Sure Strike if I had the, uh, the Unexplained Disappearance in hand, right? I agree. <laughs> I agree. But, yeah, but, but then he, I guess it could be protected in some I, way I don't or actually know why he played it first, but he played it like ultra yeah. safe there. And he is maintaining his clock, though it is currently at a slightly awkward three turns. He can get his opponent to one, and he does have the Poisoner, but he doesn't want to trade it off for the Burglar Rat. So attack for five. Let's see if this thing gets through. Seth is in the tank. Wow, price of fame. He's just going to bite the bullet here. And interestingly, Matthew Stein is going to value keeping the City Watch Sphinx around by putting it back in his hand rather than letting it die. I think it's just one of his better threats in his deck, and he'd rather just have that in his hand than have the uh, bounce spell there. Yeah, and Seth, uh, you know, let him do that. Seth could have cast that uh, on the previous turn. Yeah. It also matters in a pretty big way because Price of Fate then does not resolve, Flame, excuse me, does not resolve, and there will be no Surveil. Oh my goodness, uh, really, really strong card here from Seth. Uh, what is it? I, I believe he is. has con uh, Concoct, Connive. Connive, Concoct, okay. Connive, Concoct. So <coughs> he could use that to get rid of the Sphinx. 
next turn. And in a pretty clean way as well. Um, no, no, this one is going to return Niv Mizzet to the battlefield. This is the rare one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, concoct. Oh, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's even better, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, it <laughs> Thank you, Jake. Perhaps, perhaps I'm wrong that that's which one it was. There because are two I gold split cards, though I didn't see either, yeah. so I, I assume you're right. To be honest, <laughs> either one would be pretty good here. Yeah. And I think that either way, we will find out very shortly. Ooh, can I have concoct really good here? Oh, there's five mana. And there it is. Going to play concoct. Which, like you said, is effectively Niv Mizzet just coming back to the battlefield for five mana. Yeah, plus you get to scry. That is a tough. That is a tough one to, to look at there if you're Matthew Stein. Surveil even. <laughs> and uh, on the term of four, where I, I said that Seth had allowed uh, Matthew Stein to, uh, to, bounce. You know, to bounce his mm -hmm. Sphinx by not using the price of fame on his turn, I actually don't think that's true. I think uh, you know, Matthew actually did have the two mana open to protect that Sphinx. Uh, so Seth actually got Matthew to tap that mana for the capture sphere pre-combat in some way or another and put Matthew in a situation where Matthew had a full turn cycle where he had the Sphinx and could not recast it. So a really tight play there in that regard. Tough choice for Seth Manfield on whether to bring back Niv Mizzet or no, nope, there was nothing else. Niv Mizzet Perun is back. There is just no way that Matthew Stein is going to be able to beat Niv Mizzet twice, right? I don't think so. And now with that Command the Storm, Seth drawing an extra card, getting to ping off that rat, or that Poisoner, rather. Oof. The Nonbo here for Matthew Stein as well. There's a Plague Crafter in the top two cards. He's got the old Capture Sphere Plague Crafter combo going. That's not where you want to be. Wow, what a game. This has been awesome. This two has lands been in hand for game. Matthew Stein and Seth Manfield. Numero uno. And it's for a reason. He is going to find his way to victory here. Give a little high five to his dragon friend there as well. But still, he had to navigate through this game. Matthew Sun with some pretty sweet plays in the middle part, but it is not going to be enough. And he's going to scoop him up and say, well, Niv Mizzet's pretty cool, I guess. <laughs> Do you think his story to his friends is going to be, nah, he had Niv Mizzet. Like nothing about the cool game or the sweet beacon bolt play or... Just I don't know. I think that the fact that he got to be on camera, he got to play against the number one player in the world. You know, here he is undefeated. He played really well. Yeah, um, but, but, you know, if, if you end up losing, you're just like, yeah, bomb rare. What am I supposed to do? Yeah, also, lots of credit there to Seth Manfield. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Rashad really did get a picture for us. There's your buddy, the venerated Loxodon, though we didn't know he was behind us at the time. <laughs> Uh, we're in full commentary <laughs> mode. And the Loxodon's just staring with dead eyes into the screen. You know, he looked kind of cuter when he was walking by. I, I don't know if I'm as big a fan uh. now. <laughs> it's creepy. <laughs> Rashad, make it go away. All right, thank you. Lots of credit to Seth, though, in that last game. Uh, I, I think through the first three quarters of that game, it felt to me like Matthew was in a, a dominating position even. Uh, you know, he played around that lava coil beautifully. He did a lot of things right. And Seth just bided his time. He played a very defensive game. Uh, he put Matthew in a position where Matthew felt like he had the long game to his advantage. And because Seth had access to both Niv Mizzet and Concoct, er, Concoct Connive, uh, it just put him in a situation where his end game, his top end, was just more powerful than anything you could possibly imagine from the other side of the table. Don't forget this, too. Seth Manfield is not the only number one player in the world. We've also got Luis Salvato on 81 points to finish the season. That means that they are going to be playing a playoff at some point. It is also going to be some undetermined format. We don't even know. It's going to be sweet no matter what. I remember the last time this happened, was eight years ago. Mm. With your buddy. Yeah, yeah. Guillaume Matignon and Brad Nelson got to play against each other, I believe, in Paris. It was in Paris, yeah. That was a, a really, really exciting event. And I'm, I'm excited that we get to have another oh no. playoff. Oh, like no, that. there's the elephant again. 
The Loxodon Creep Stalker. Oh, he has his helmet off, though. <laughs> he's out of character and he's on camera. That thing's, like, he was stalking us, right, in that photo? That was not just an they're, elephant they're standing there being venerated, right? <laughs> he was looking and being weird. The elephant in the room. Seriously. That game one took a lot of time, though. These are both very controlling decks. Um, yeah, you're right. We're under 20 minutes now on the clock. Chat's wondering how long the elephant was standing there, and I kind of want to know now myself. You will see a heightened speed of play from these players as they recognize that that game ended up taking quite a while. Super aggro start here for Seth Manfield. Poisoner on turn one. Nothing on turn two except for a gateway plaza. Plaza's really nice on turn two, though, when you're one of these more controlling decks and uh, your opponent hasn't played any cards yet. It means that you can reliably cast the majority of your deck for virtually the remainder of the game, uh, as long as you're hitting additional land drops, regardless of what they are. Yeah, and he's really not punished here for, for taking the time to get that gateway plaza into play. You know, Boros deck sometimes can be like, sweet. That's where you put your two mana. In the meantime, Leapfrog actually is fairly aggressive here for Seth Manfield, especially if he has a removal spell for the Darkblade agent. Ooh, nothing? Mm, maybe his mana's not so great. And Seth there respecting the amount of removal that is in Matthew Stein's deck. Uh, you know, it may be tempting there to attack with one of your two creatures that has the ability to trade with that agent, thinking to yourself, well, I still have this great blocker here, but uh, you know, by by not attacking with either, you prevent yourself from finding yourself in a situation where your opponent removes the blocker hmm. while also surveilling and then getting to draw an additional card. This is really interesting. Take a look at the land on Matthew Stein's side of the battlefield. That's a Golgari Guildgate. I just looked at his green. You know the card that stands out? Crushing Canopy. I think he's like, I need an answer for Niv-Mizzet, and he may have gone deep on the, uh, on the sideboard plan here, potentially. Because we did not see that, right? That he's not playing that gate for side value. So my, my guess is that he actually went for a crushing canopy. A card can also deal with capture sphere. Mm -hmm. We saw that in uh, a previous round. Okay, is it lock it? And I think he's gonna get aggressive and just lava coil here. Ooh, he's thinking about it. Ooh, there's a green card in hand for Matthew. Yeah, that is a crushing canopy in his hand. So Matthew Stein showing some chops here and going deep on the sideboard plan. I like it. I like it a lot. You know, you have to make do with what's available to you and uh, Matthew recognizing that he needs a clear uh, I only get two for one to buy niv at play. AKA the best case scenario. I mean, it is that bad. That card is just that good. Though, right now, Seth Manfield is absolutely miles away from casting niv it with just one blue source at the ready. This Darkblade Agent, unfortunately for Stein, didn't get to hit last time with its extra triggered ability, but this time, thanks to Whisper Agent, it will. Also, no good news here for Seth Manfield. Matthew kept the, uh, the card on top of his library that he's about to draw right now. Yeah, it looks like an artful takedown, too. A nice one. Ooh, another Darkblade Agent as well. This one could really have gotten away from Manfield if he doesn't have something to affect the board pretty immediately here. He could be in really bad shape. Because at this point, Stein can just attack with everything. He can even throw away a Darkblade Agent mm -hmm. for the Leapfrog and still get in for five and maybe even trigger it again. I've liked Darkblade Agent quite a bit in decks that have a lot of uh, hard removal. Mm. I think that... You like playing the bouncer, kill your thing, hit you. Draw a card, yeah. Like, a lot of the time you find yourself in these, these games that just feel unlosable because you're drawing multiple cards a turn and you're using one card to deal with one of your opponent's cards. And soon, uh, your opponent has very few cards left in hand and play and you just have way more resources than them 
All right, this does affect the board. This is Deadly Visit from Manfield to kill one of the Dark Blade agents and make that attack that I described last time look a lot worse. If he has any more surveil going on, then, then Matt is going to want to keep that Dark Blade agent alive. Can still attack with Whisper Agent. Ooh, nice drop. Beacon Bolt off the top of the library with the one Lava Coil in his graveyard is just enough to kill Leapfrog and crash in for five damage. Got to be happy with that. Sometimes one is all you need. Playing a little frog baseball here, and boom! In comes the team for five. Now, Beacon Bolt, of course, has nothing to do with Surveil, so we don't get any type of trigger there. But still, it's two damage, in addition to the three from Whisper Agent. Seth's down to nine. It's a thing. Interesting. So here's a great question now. Does Matthew just use Artful Takedown to kill the Electrostatic Field? I think so. I think I would. I, I think I would have two. Two turn clock and uh, and any surveil lets, you know, guarantee that that Whisper agent, or the Dark Blade agent, excuse me, gets through again. But he chose not to, so his clock is now way, way lower. Three full damage. Eh, he's just going to pass the turn back. He decides he not to uh, finish it off with Beacon Bolt. He, yeah, he just he drew a, a devious cover up here. And now we see Manfield spring his trap here, command the storm, targeting the agent. I shouldn't say that. There's two agents on the battlefield, the Dark Blade agent. Hey, Matthew declined to uh, use his devious cover up there. Yeah, Matthew is just still really settling in. But I, I got to tell you here, Jake, not only strategically, would you, would, would I want to see him consider using the removal and protecting his threats? But clockwise, this is a real issue, right? Like, mm -hmm. he wants to win the match. He needs to do it in this game and next game. And he's settling in for a very long game, which, uh, you know, strategically speaking, might, might benefit him. But if, if it means that the best chance you have is to uh, take a draw, then that's not great. We might, ha we might have a devious cover-up to hit, to hit this disdainful stroke. Seth seems fine with fighting over it. As Matthew Stein has reconsidered his option and is now firing off the artful takedown. And it's interesting because this fight is uh, happening on Matthew's turn as opposed to him having picked this fight on Seth's end step. And it looks like uh, Matthew is going to use expansion there to copy something. What did he copy? Uh, it looked like he copied the Artful Takedown okay. to, to, again, target. Okay. So that works, too, and it lets him keep the counterspell in hand. Muse Drake now from Seth Manfield. Doesn't look great, but in combination with Direct Current, looks fine. He's now got the board completely, uh, completely settled. Ooh, another splash here. Affectionate Indrick now from Matthew Stein. The Snuggle Beast himself has arrived. This card's just adorable. Oh, yeah. It just snuggled that Muse Drake right into Oblivion. And now he's got a really nice setup here where if he gets to untap, he can protect his Indrick, and it's a lethal threat. Everybody loves Affectionate Indrick. But City Watch Sphinx of Manfield says, you're my only hope. And this should be game because that sideboard technology, crushing canopy for Matthew Stein, says get that thing out of here. And that's going to be game. All right, well, this okay. This actually did end up being relatively quick, which means that we have a shot to finish the match. I'm a little concerned about it, but we've got 11 minutes. Hopefully they can sideboard very quickly and then get back to business. Manfield's the one who has a lot more information now as Matthew has switched his third color from red to green. Or maybe he's just added green. Yeah, the crushing canopy there was great. The affection Indrick was great. Yep. Uh, Matthew Stein, uh, you know, showing uh, a lot of skill, a lot of expertise. It's clear that he's played a good amount of this limit format, that he knows what he's doing. Oh, uh, there's the elephant again. 
Because it's scary. Starting to splash that. Is that guy killer. trying to feed the animals back there? You don't. No, no, don't feed the elephant. Oh, elephant took it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> These elephants are thirsty. Yeah. We, yeah. Gotta, we need to sign up. Don't feed the <laughs> the wild animals. Uh, the planet's head back down. Oh, uh, no, don't. Yeah, leave it. I always think about that that baby elephant alone in the that documentary, Planet Earth. What? Yeah, very sad. <laughs> no idea what you're talking about, but I am definitely feeling the uh, the two-headed elephant now walking by. <laughs> 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 what in the world? Oh man, <laughs> it's probably pretty warm in there. To be fair. Oh no, it's coming back this direction. Don't look at it, Jake. Don't look at it. All right, so it looks like they've taken minute and a half so far on sideboards and now are shuffling, which provided no mulligans means we're probably about another one minute away, eight and a half minutes. Boy, they it's played that one tough. very, oh no, oh no. Seth is going back for another, another quick look at the sideboard to make sure he's got it all right. Oh, but it looks like he did. Nope, he's looking again. Yeah, he's going to make a last-minute change. Th the problem here is just the, uh, the the clock, right? Oh. Wants to make sure he's presenting a 40-card deck. Yeah, he. I think what happened was is that he actually didn't. I think something got screwed up. So... One of the reasons that you see people pile shuffle, some of it's just honestly just out of habit because people have been doing it for years. It's not considered an actual shuffle, right? That doesn't sufficiently randomize your deck. You have to do riffle shuffles. But mm -hmm. e what people do is they often count the cards in their library to make sure that it's legal and correct and everything. And I think what we're seeing here is Seth has actually realized that his deck had more cards in it than he realized. Oh, no, he must have just miscounted because he just put them back in. And you can see he looks a little like, I don't know what just happened there. The problem is, of course, that our clock is now ticking woefully quickly towards eight minutes, and they still have to get these things sufficiently randomized. They still have to resolve mulligans, and they still have to finish an entire game between these two grindy decks. So getting a little nervous here, Jake, that we may end up with a draw, but hopefully these players can get things sorted out quickly, and we get a good game to finish things up. Because that last game didn't take very long. No, it did not. And there he goes. You know, all you need is seven riffles to have a sufficiently randomized deck. Seth gave us eight. <laughs> <laughs> you could see Matthew like getting really. Come on, come yeah, on, come on, dude. Count to forty. Understandably, for you know, that just the, the sideboarding alone there. All right, we're underway here. Both players kept their opening sevens. We got seven and a half minutes. And a little bit of writing to do here. Thought erasure from Matthew Stein is going to see the big kid, Niv Mizzet, leapfrog. He's got the City Watch Sphinx. Is that a Wojek bodyguard at the bottom? I believe it's a... Uh, a barging sergeant, I mean? Yeah, it's a barging sergeant. The 4-2 haste. Yeah. The mentor. What in the world? And then a muse drake. Yeah, well, maybe I mean, Seth just decided to go aggro. Yeah, I mean, he's only got a few minutes left to win this match. Uh, a four-power haste creature seems like a good way to win in short order. Here's Leapfrog. It's another good way to win in not a lot of time. Oops. Demir Informant's a great brick wall for the Leapfrog, provided Seth doesn't cast a string of instants and sorceries. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it was Niv Mizzet, of course, that uh, got taken by Thought Erasure, as Matthew Stein has certainly had his hands full with that card in game number one. <coughs> You know, if I'm in Seth's position there, I'm not sure if I even hate just lava axing Matthew by using the direct current and attacking with the leapfrog. Just go upstairs with, with the current. Yeah, well, exactly. This is a big play, though, here from Seth Manfield. The barging sergeant is on the battlefield, and it looks really good here. Yeah, this matches up real nice. Yeah, and it's so good that Matthew Stein actually has to use unexplained disappearance just to delay that attack. Like, that's how good that card is here because it means the Leapfrog gets to attack through the Demir Informant where the Demir Informant currently is holding it back. Let's see if uh, Matthew Stein maybe has found a counterspell or something along those lines to help deal with this. Oh, I see what he's found, actually. Hypothesizzle. So if Seth Manfield 
if Seth Manfield just says, ah, whatever, and just runs it out, then he can hypothesize it. So he's going to take a different route here, suspecting something like that or a devious cover-up. But really nice for Matt Stein. He's got himself a whisper agent, so he still gets to use some of his mana for the turn. Yeah, and that's also going to make Seth want to just walk right into this hypothesis because he, after having passed yes. the turn and seen a whisper agent, he's surely going to think to himself, oh, that's what was going on there. But nope, no, not, Seth not is, Seth. Seth's way better than everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and he just sees a real, well, he just sees a nice plan here, too, yeah. right? I mean, direct current, plus to kill your whisper agent, plus he gets the extra value from the field. That's still a very good use of his mana. Mm hmm. And here's Hypothesis. It looks like Stein says, you know what, I can't wait around. He may have to just use it on the Leapfrog. But no, he's just going to draw the two cards. Take his four damage. No, I'm wrong. He is going to discard. So he did have the answer for the Barging Sergeant with that devious cover-up. But he decided that the immediate threat was more important. And he needed to kill the Leapfrog. So he's going to do so here. And now it looks like Matthew's basically all out of gas. Yeah. So long term, he gives up a bit here. But that Leapfrog could have been responsible for a lot of damage this turn, even without the Sergeant. So Manfield kind of refusing to play into, I don't know, anything here. He's just going to go with the, is it lock it, and then pass the turn back. Ooh, Lava Coil off the top for Matthew Stein. And he's got Devious cover up, too. So he does have his bases covered, though. He is a little bit behind on board. Not that much. He's got plenty of time to find something. The card that I'm actually worried about if I'm sitting in Matthew Stein's seat right now is that is it Locket. Like, that's the type of card that's really annoying when you're holding a removal spell and a counter spell because Seth could just overpower you with cards. Yeah, and it looks like Seth is probably going to be able to do that if he has enough time to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to remember there's only three and a half minutes left in this match here. Seth. Electing not to crack yep. the locket. Well, it's interesting because both players have elected not to crack the lockets. I don't know why. Right now, Seth Manfield has eight mana. Maybe he has devious cover up in his hand and he wants to leave that open in addition to the barging sergeant. It's absolutely a possibility. I mean, it makes like me think that he would have that mana. Now, for Matthew, though, he's got a demure locket in there, doesn't he? Boy, I'm surprised he hasn't cracked that. I think Matthew actually has an is it locket. Oh, it's an is it locket, not a Demir locket. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, that makes more sense. Then. All right, well, we're going to see Devious cover up then on the Barging Sergeant. And that looks fine. And it was Devious cover up from Seth Manfield. We get to see why he didn't crack it. Yeah, uh, a method to the madness going on there. Yeah, it made sense. Oh, but look at this. Matthew Stein has his own copy of expansion here that he can copy Seth's devious cover up with. Counter that, and then Matthew can even shuffle in a few of his uh, more powerful options at this point. Oh boy, two minutes to go. Jake, this one's starting to get a little sketchy. Yeah, this is looking like it is more likely than not going to end in a draw. Yeah, I still like Seth's position here, though, because he has a locket that he can crack. He can reload his hand and still have mana available to cast stuff. And he doesn't need a ton. He just needs to find a threat or two. In the meantime, Matthew Stein is down to basically nothing. Now he can crack the it locket, though, so that could open up something for him. Yeah, Matthew still has that lava coil also, so... Yep. He only needs to survive for a minute and a half, and this last, we've been seeing turn cycles take, you know, just under a minute, so. Yeah, City Watch thinks exactly what Matthew wants to see, although he needs to maintain his red mana, so now he can't crack the locket again. And there we go, Lava Coil to exile the Sphinx is the perfect answer. A Hired Poisoner, not so great here. Coming up on a minute. And there's a locket hitting the graveyard now for Manfield. Desperate to find a threat so that he can start applying more pressure here down the stretch and not pick up a draw in his very first round of the tournament. Says 3-0, but he's coming off of three buys here. His deck looks really strong, too. Believe that was Hypothesis off the top of the library for Stein. He did just shuffle that back in. Boy, that locket's been doing work for him. She's producing the red mana. 
And now he gets to discard a Golgari Locket just to kill a Muse Drake, attack in for one. Uh, go. Manfield's feeling the pressure. You saw him put his hand on his head there. And we may be headed towards a draw here, Jake. Not a fun way to end our main feature match, especially one that's been so interesting. Now, I wonder if there's, like, can I have concoct here would be awesome for Seth and set himself up to actually win the game in time. If he could get back Niv Mizza. Yeah, I think that's really what, what he needs right now. Seth, just do you see that big head shake from him there, Jake? He is just going, ugh. Yeah. Got to be some way to get the job done here. He is ahead here, but yeah. he's in no means, uh, you know, just a slam dunk to win at no. this point. He needs and a big flyer. I mean, he needed that City Watch Sphinx to stay on the battlefield. Oh, no. Maximize altitude here from Seth. Guess he's just going to try to do anything he can to get damage through. So this look at him in for three damage plus two triggers off of the electrostatic field. I mean, it's a reasonable amount of damage, but that's not really repeatable. Remember, he does have... Um a direct current in the yard also. Okay, so that represents another three damage. If it goes upstairs. Now our timer has gone, I'm assuming that down in the feature match area, the time will be called on the players as well. What did he discard? The island there? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's three in the air. Four, five, six, seven. Wow, he's actually piling on a lot of damage here. Yeah, and is this direct current going to be an additional three damage, which could end the game? Because that sure strike was just four damage. Yeah. So this is four is three, so that's six. So that puts Matthew down to three, and the direct current is le Oh, my goodness wow. gracious. Seth Manfield puts together an unlikely win on the last turn <laughs> before uh, the extra turn started. <laughs> and somehow in his control deck, he went to an aggro is it build and killed him with a Muse Drake, a maximized altitude, and a direct current with that electrostatic field just pecking away every single time. Wow, great stuff from the feature match area. And we did actually get a natural conclusion. Seth Manfield wins the match and improves to and oh, we're going to take a commercial break because as you can see behind us, players are getting ready to go into the round for the next one. We'll be back with more right after this.